Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Steve Crosher, the CEO of MoreTech, who's going to talk today about resolution and how that plays into in-circuit monitoring. Steve, there's been a lot of discussion about in-circuit monitoring simply because we need higher reliability than what we've had in the past. What's changing there? What's new? And so uh, what we're seeing is, uh, in particular, with the, uh, the advanced nodes, if we're going down from 28 nanometer all the way down to five nanometer, we're seeing that uh, the, the complexity of the designs and the complexity of the devices, and also the, uh, the variability that we're seeing um, on the silicon uh, today uh, kind of creates this uh, uncertainty in the behavior of the silicon. And um, when you apply sort of uh, varying workloads with uh, multi-core architectures, um, you know, you have this environment where um, trying to assess reliability uh, sometimes becomes a bit challenging, especially if you look at certain market sectors such as automotive and, and more often than not nowadays, also other areas such as uh, data center and high performance computing, for example. A lot of this came out of the automotive, but it seems to be shifting into other areas as well. So you think about a data center, for example, they want their chips to last a, a longer time than have what they have in the past. And even in cell phones, the uh, changeover on a smartphone, it used to be two years. Now, sometimes they want, they're looking for a minimum of four years. So what does that do, particularly as we get down into these, these really advanced nodes where you have very complex chips? Um, at, the, uh, at the sort of system level, um, and when you're applying reliability, uh, the uh, uninterrupted service, uh, that, that, is, that is a key uh, aspect. Um, the uppime uh, for systems, and you know that's apl certainly applicable for, for, for data center. Um, I think the challenges they have uh, when you look at the advanced nodes and how that mixes with a high performance compute or data center environment is that a lot of the time uh, these devices are working at the extreme. You know, they really need to be uh, reaching high data throughput levels. Um, there, there's high sort of algorithmic capacities that need to be reached and uh, really making most of the power um, that's available uh, to the devices. So that's where it becomes quite nuanced and having the ability to see uh, what the activity is like within those chips um, certainly helps towards uh, the device's reliability in terms of reducing electrical voltage and also thermal stress to try and uh, have a longer lifetime and uh, a longer life cycle uh, for the silicon. And what we're starting to see is the opportunity here to in some systems, and if the uh, assessments can be made through analytics, uh, to determine uh, what points of the, the silicon's lifetime you can intersect to apply some maintenance, um, and also to the point where you're starting to be able to uh, statistically predict uh, failure uh, of the silicon, which is you know, of huge benefit to the, uh, to the systems and the, and the system operators and also uh, the products that spin out of this. And that adds a whole different level of um, reliability here because what you're doing now is, is not just saying, oh, this chip it has failed. What you're saying is this chip may fail at this particular time or in this general time frame. And so you're doing predictive analytics. That's been the holy grail for things like data centers, right? Uh, yes, that, that, that's right. And um, uh, if you're applying uh, circuits within the silicon, deep within the silicon, um, you can start to look at other aspects uh, that also have an impact uh, on its life cycle. Um, if you're able to make assessments prior to mission mode as well, you're also allowed to, to, to apply some screening. So that silicon that is deployed into the field, you can make some selection as to what you think will be uh, longer lifetime devices uh, compared to others that may go to a different application. So what we're seeing at the moment is this whole field of um, in-chip monitoring uh, through the chip's life cycle and uh, telemetry of data uh, coming out of the devices 
uh, combined with the uh, uh, analysis of that data is creating a whole new environment. And that's why we're seeing um, a lot of interest in what we're doing, um, but also a lot of activity uh, just generally in the marketplace in terms of uh, uh, specialist analytics companies um, popping up and uh, applying uh, particular uh, unique analysis and different angles on the data that's been uh, extracted from not just the silicon, but also the, the products themselves. So let's drill into this a bit. Sure. So Steve, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is um, uh, essentially showing the life cycle of the chip as it goes from the design stage through to uh, deployment and into the field and into the applications mission mode. So in-circuit monitoring has been around for essentially uh, a number of decades. Um, but what we're seeing now is that if there's the option and the possibility to integrate sensors uh, within a subsystem that are meaningful and producing insightful data as part of the, the general system uh, within the chip, uh, you can then start to extract data at every stage. And as an IP vendor that's been delivering uh, monitors and sensors and sensing subsystems into advanced node technology devices, um, that's the position we find ourselves in, in that we can be generating uh, this insightful, meaningful data that helps the system and the system level uh, for, for basically improving product optimization or uh, reliability of devices. What's changed from the standpoint of these things have been around for a couple of decades, why now? Yes, so uh, the demands essentially uh, that are placed on technology products uh, needing to be higher reliability and less likely to fail and less interruptions. Um, also in terms of uh, battery uh, power devices uh, uh, and trying to extend the battery lifetimes um, and also uh, when you look at the you know, seismic change that we've seen over the last few years with the amount of data that is put into the cloud and the amount of data that is then processed into the cloud, um, it's trying to make the most uh, uh, efficiency from, from the power that, say, goes into data centers for computation. And so what we're seeing is if we can be insightful within the silicon and the activity within the chip, we can then optimize uh, that power that's being used essentially for computation for you know, cloud applications that we're all using today within our, within our technology today. A lot of these centers that were developed in years past though were sort of generalized. There's a thermal uh, gradient here which is different than what we expected it to be. And now that you're down to five nanometers heading into three nanometers, the tolerances are much tighter. Do the sensors have to be that much more accurate in order to predict what's going to happen? Yes, yeah, certainly there's, there's, there's a desire uh, to have more accurate sensors uh, in terms of thermal sensors because you then have a tighter thermal guard banding. For example, uh, the levels at which you start to throttle clock frequencies of the system back. You know, if the temperature is rising too high on the silicon, uh, you want to do that at the latest point uh, possible. Um, in terms of what we see, uh, we see that there are uh, you know, repeated structures in terms of multi-core architectures where being able to monitor the temperature of say each processor core uh, becomes more valuable. Um, the software that's been written and the way the software is deployed can sometimes be unpredictable in terms of the use of um, workloads on each of the cores. So if you're able to sense uh, temperature for each of those cores and very locally, uh, you can then apply uh, better um, workload balancing schemes across those cores, ultimately uh, for longer lifetime and um, you know, also uh, in consideration of uh, the power that, that goes into the chip. So what happens when we get into multi-chip or multi-die packages where now you have chips scattered in multiple different places and these are supposed to be known good die and they're supposed to be behaving within certain parameters. 
but the effects on temperature as well as things like vibration and other uh, physical effects can be additive even though the individual chips are within the normal range. What we're seeing there is you're going from um, package structures that rather than just containing one die are then inc being increased to multiple dies and you're also seeing that some of those die are being used for different um, purposes. So uh, obviously things like stacked memory um, and then uh, silicon for the actual computation itself. And there may be even some interfacing or some analog uh, silicon uh, that's also incorporated. What it does is it creates an environment that is more uncertain in the field, in the mission mode, uh, as to how that's gonna behave thermally. You have multiple uh, system level software in operation uh, for uh, you know potentially for each die that's uh, being used, so it's that unpredictability. Um, and there's only so far you can go with the modelling, and uh, at the design phase, um, that only gets you so far. What you're needing to do is actually see what's happening in real time, uh, actually in its operation, uh, to make judgments as to. Uh, whether you're um, overstressing or overheating uh, the device. There's the compounding problem as well of uh, heat dissipation when you have multiple dye um, within one, one package. And so these are real challenges uh, for the industry. Um, and so it's a combination of things um, that are help us make sure that the, uh, uh, the, the products are, are reliable um, going forward. And really, when we speak about known good dye, it's known good dye in context over time, right? Yes, and this is known good dye and um, the, the, the ability to make those assessments on known good dye uh, to a greater degree is obviously going to be helpful um, for the eventual deployment of the silicon. And you can also make those assessments in terms of um, which application certain dye should be applied to. Um, it's, it, you know, it's quite a common concept uh, that we've seen in, in other walks of life, if you like, and in, if, and in other technology spheres, that if you're providing people with more information, uh, their decision making can be that much better for the improvement of, of products. So Steve, one of the things that's changed here is that when we used to think about designing chips, they were at most four to seven years, seven years for the, uh, the data centers and even some of the industrial things. Now we're expecting some of these chips to last 10, 20 years. What happens with that? What changes there in terms of what do you need to keep track of? When you're designing in particular for, say, um, applications that do require high reliability, that's often the spaces where you have that long lifetime. And what we're seeing is that for the advanced nodes, um, some good assessment is being made um, at the simulation level and the modeling level in terms of understanding uh, device lifetime. Um, but obviously we're at the very early stage of some of these advanced nodes, uh, say for example, for five nanometer and they'll be deployed. We'll have some indication of uh, how they're behaving in a maturity sort of way um, just over the next uh, uh, couple of years. But obviously they're going into designs that could potentially be out there for 15 uh, to 20 years. So what is the opportunity there? Uh, the opportunity is to be uh, one, um, making better assessments of the die as it goes through uh, its life cycle in terms of um, manufacture and packaging and deployment and then also actually while it's in uh, its mission mode and in field and making assessments for the uh, for the remaining sort of 15 20 years of its lifetime we are collecting a lot of data these days as a matter of fact i think everybody's drowning in data does the sampling rate that you develop here does that change and does that affect the amount of data that's being produced yeah, that's interesting because I'd say there's kind of two levels to, to, to sampling rates and, and the data. The first level is with um, uh, at the very sort of uh, micro level within the silicon, um, quite often uh, you see bursty behavior, um, especially in say AI applications uh, where utilizations of cores can be switched on very quickly. Um, you want a, a fast response uh, in terms of thermal 
uh, sensing uh, to understand and, and, and try and protect those devices. Um, in terms of the, the, the longer lifetime and the, and the longer life cycle, um, we're seeing that, yeah, data can be produced to understand uh, things like thermal uh, profiles um, uh, that have been applied depending on the software. Um, you can also start to see over a chip's lifetime the uh, um, thermal signatures uh, during that period. You can also get an understanding of how the chip has been designed into the product and whether it's been given a fair chance to, to sort of reach those uh, 15, 20 year cycles. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we're drowning in data um, and this applies to a, a kind of secondary area in that, okay, you can have sensors pouring this information out, but you have to make that information meaningful. You, you can't just be uh, sending raw data. Um, there has to be some interpretation of that data to make it insightful. And that's another area where we see uh, there being much movement in the marketplace and uh, something that we're particularly interested in. Steve Crusher, thanks for a great explanation. My pleasure, Ed. Many thanks.